Thank you very much, Barbara. It's great, great to be back in my favorite bookstore here, and especially with you, with that wonderful introduction. It is funny to hear the talk about being the real writer. Uh, I was once asked to do something for that Washington Post page that you may know called The Writing Life. And I wrote something, and my daughter, who was then 13 and spent a lot of time in the store, and she was truly an aspiring novelist, and she said to me, Dad, you're not a real writer. You're just a journalist and a biographer. And to that I pl plead guilty. Uh, I, as much as I did have that yearning once to be a real writer, I began to see what, uh, what a glory it was to, to have the joy of being a journalist and a writer. Because what you get to do is follow people, understand how they act, and understand how they affect the tenor of our time. You know, Henry Luce, who founded the magazine where I worked for so long, Time Magazine, was once accused, because he always uh, did sort of biographical portraits on the cover, of sort of uh, indulging in personality journalism. And he said, no, Time Magazine did not invent personality journalism. The Bible did. That's how we tell stories that have meaning. That's how we try to convey the moral lessons of our time. So, as Barbara said, I've always tried to be interested in creative people. You know, if you're in this bookstore, if you're in this town, you know a whole lot of smart people. I'm not sure this is working, so yeah, it is okay. People in the back. Uh, you know a whole lot of smart people. And you kind of realize after a while that smart people are a dime a dozen and that they don't often amount to much. Um, what does matter is creative people. People can think out of the box, come up with something new. Uh, and so in this book, I tried to look at very smart people and figure out how they had to have a moral center, how they had to think differently, how they had to be creative. For example, in 1905, all the smartest uh, uh, physicists in Europe uh, were trying to figure out why the speed of light seemed constant. Um, there were a lot of people who were smarter than Albert Einstein in terms of their learning and their knowledge. There's Max Planck, there was Poincaré, they're all working on this problem. Einstein was simply a third class patent clerk working at the Swiss Patent Office. But in his spare time, he realized that the speed of light is always constant, but as you try to catch up with the speed of light, time slows down for you. It was an amazing leap of the imagination, an act of creativity that was done by a patent clerk and not by a professional scientist. In fact, it took him another five years before he even got a job as an academic scientist, because that's how long it took the rest of the scientific community to figure out this leap of the imagination. And so whether it's Henry Kissinger or Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton or Benjamin Franklin or Ronald Reagan, I've always tried as a journalist to look at what made somebody stand out. What, why did they have a special characteristic that made them different from the people around them? As Barbara said, I got inspired by the first real writer I ever knew, uh, Walker Percy. And I do hope his books are still here because I will tell you that I marvel at his philosophical grace and his understated wit. Every time I pull down the well-thumbed copies of The Movie Goer or The Last Gentleman from my shelf. You know, uh, he was uh, the uncle of my best friend, a guy named Tom Cowan. So when we were young, we used to go across Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans and go fishing and turtle hunting and water skiing uh, at uh, Walker per Uncle Walker's house. Nobody quite knew what Uncle Walker did. I once asked his daughter, Ann, what does your dad do? He's at home all day. And uh, she said, well, you know, he was a doctor, but he never practiced. That's why he was called Dr. Percy in town. Uh, but he stayed at home and wrote. It was only a few years later, uh, after the moviegoer had finally become famous, that I realized that being a writer was something you could actually do for a living, just like being a doctor or an engineer or a fisherman or anything else. So I said, that's really cool. And as Barbara said, I was growing up in New Orleans. So I started haunting the French Quarter bars in which 
William Faulkner and Sherwood Anderson and Tennessee Williams, and I'd keep a journal in the corner table at the Napoleon House. I was saved from those pretensions uh, partly by journalism. I finally was able to get a job at the Times-Picayune on the very early police beat at police headquarters starting at 5 a.m. as a summer job. And I realized that even though I might never write the great American novel, I was addicted to the notion of storytelling. That was another thing Walker Percy had taught me. Because after thumbing through his novels and realizing, oh, this is a real writer, he would put up with my earnest questioning. I'd talk to him some. And I sort of began to notice that there were messages in his wonderful tales, a message in a bottle sort of thing. And they were philosophical messages, sometimes religious messages. So I would ask him about these messages and what he, the themes he tried to do in the story. And he wouldn't really talk about it much. He said there were two types of people who came out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for goodness sake, be a storyteller. <laughs> Once again, it was sort of the way the Bible does it. It's the parts of the Bible that work are those wonderful story tales, stories, that tell you the moral lessons in a subtle way. I mean, after all, it's one of the great leads of all time in the beginning, and it tells you the power of chronological storytelling. So that's what Dr. Percy taught me, too. And so as a journalist, I was able to just tell tales. I remember the first t day I was on the job, and I had the worst of all possible stories you could be assigned to cover. It was the murder of a very small child. And I went to Carrollton Avenue and was there with the police, got all the things. And this was the days before Blackberries and emails and cell phones or anything else. So I went to the corner drugstore, put in my dime, and called the uh, newspaper to dictate the story to the rewrite desk. And the rewrite man was a grizzled old guy named Billy Rainey. And after I dictated what I had, he said, well, what did the parents say? And I said, well, I didn't talk to the parents. He said, well, go back in there, knock on the door, and talk to the parents. I thought, I was appalled at that notion. But I worked up my courage, went, knocked on the door, and I discovered the next lesson of writing and journalism, which is people want to talk. I got invited in. They wanted to show me the albums. They kept talking on and on about how wonderful this little baby girl was. And as they did so, I realized that this was part of the transaction of both storytelling and journalism. It's how we work through things. And at one point, uh, the woman touched me on the knee and said, I hope you don't mind me telling you all of this. I was reminded of that many years later. I was at Time Magazine, and Woody Allen had just gotten into that uh, kerfluffle by having dated Mia Farrow's daughter. Or, and, uh, and so it was a great big scandal. And suddenly, the phone rings at Time Magazine, where I then was. And it's Woody Allen, who I didn't really know, saying, could I come over? He wanted to give an interview. And I went over to his apartment, and it was just Woody Allen and myself sitting there, and Woody Allen wanted to talk. This was not what you would call a very good idea on his part, but he talked for hours. He actually said something that became a uh, pretty famous phrase, because when I asked him how could he do it, he said, well, the heart wants what it wants. That became one of the quotations uh, no, that this scandal was known by. But he, too, touched me on the knee halfway through and said, I hope you don't mind me telling you all this. Now, I felt a bit like uh, uh, Woody Allen's psychiatrist, which is, no, this is what I do for a living. I actually get paid for this. But it was, uh, it's, it was the great lesson of journalism is one of the reasons we have narrative stories is that people like to tell and like to work out the moral lessons and everything else through the stories. Uh, when I was working on the Times-Picayune, I tried to prove myself that every now and then. I would just pick a city, a town, a village at random in southern Louisiana and just show up there and say, I'm going to find a story. One point I went to Booty, Louisiana in the Cajun country, in the sugarcane country, and did a series of stories on um, the sugarcane workers. And I realized what a rich narrative tale it was. At this point, I was still, alas, in my real writer's phase, and I had read James Agee once too often, so I fear the story's read a little bit too uh, much with literary pretension. But uh, 
they were useful in getting me the next stage of my life. I'd gone to college, and I'd heard somebody whose book I'm sure you have up front right now is now still a friend of mine, uh, Harry Evans. Harry Evans was then the uh, young crusading editor of the Sunday Times of London. Uh, some of you know him now. His memoirs have just come out.